Hi guys and welcome to SignalR the complete guide. My name is Brogan and I will be your instructor for this course. In this course we will be learning ASP.NET Core SignalR and we will be starting from scratch. I do expect you to have basic understanding of ASP.NET Core and MVC because I will not be going into the basic foundations of what is a program file, what are views, controller and so on. The main question is, what is SignalR? Let's switch to Microsoft website where they explain basics about SignalR. First thing that you see here is real-time ASP.NET with SignalR. Incredibly simple real-time web for ASP.NET. Now what is real-time web? Real-time basically means that as soon as something is updated on the server or as soon as the data is updated, you do not have to refresh your browser. Your browser automatically renders that change. That is real time in simple term. To give you some insights here, let's say we are on walmart.com and let's go to one of the item here. At this time when the page loaded, let's assume this item was in stock. But you were deciding on this and at the same time this was the last item and someone already purchased that. So in this case, we will not see that notification here that it is sold out. Typically what happens is once you add to the cart, if you go to the cart or when you are adding to the cart, at that time it will check is the inventory available. But using SignalR, what you can do is let's say when the window is opened, there was inventory, but they were deciding on this for like 5 minutes and at the same time, someone bought the last item. What we can do is with SignalR, we can tell server that hey, inventory is gone. Server will tell our client that hey, this item inventory has gone to zero. So dynamically it will change here without refreshing that this item is no longer available. And that is the power that we can accomplish with SignalR. Now that is just a brief example of what SignalR can do. But it is not just that thing. SignalR basically makes real-time web super simple. Let's scroll down here and we see it is a part of ASP.NET Core framework. So we don't have to add anything fancy. It is an integral part of the .NET framework. What you can do with ASP.NET SignalR, one of the common example that comes is a chat application. Because when you are chatting, typically you do not refresh the page the chat automatically displays the sender and receiver's message without refreshing. So that is a common example that is displayed with SignalR. SignalR is open source, open protocol and you can view the complete code on GitHub. On top of that SignalR is super fast and scalable and Azure also supports SignalR. So there's quite a few things that we have to learn when it comes to SignalR. But to give you a 10,000 feet overview, one thing that you need to know is if you need real-time web without refreshing the browser, SignalR is the answer. But one thing that you should understand is SignalR has two pieces. One is the client side and other one is the server side. Now these client and server are both integral pieces of SignalR application itself. So SignalR will have a server which we will call as hub and then there can be many SignalR clients that will communicate with the SignalR hub in real time. I won't go into much details right now because we will be exploring all of this throughout the course and everything will make much more sense. Let me show you what we will be learning in this course. You can see right now on the home page we have something called as total views and total connection. If I open a new incognito window here and if I paste the same URL, you will notice that total views and total connections are updating. If you refresh the page here, the total view updates and it simultaneously updates in both the windows even though we are not working on the other window. That is the power of SignalR. On top of that, if we connect to one other window here, you will notice that total connection in all the windows gets updated to 3. And if we close any of the connection, 
it decrements that to 2 because that is the total number of active connections right now. So that will show us the basics of how we can calculate total views and number of active connections in an application using SignalR. After that, we will be implementing the Deathly Halo Race where what we have to do is we basically have the endpoints here for voting. So if I select that and let me open another browser here, let me paste the URL where I have the type of cloak. If I press enter here, you will notice that count for cloak increments in all the open windows here. If I refresh the page here, the count continues to increment. So this will be like a voting count where whatever is the real count that we have, that will be updated in all the windows that have the active connection. If I change my vote to Resurrection Stone here, paste that URL and hit the enter button. It did not get copied. Let me copy this, paste it here, stone, perfect. You see, Resurrection Stone is one now. So if we keep on refreshing this tab, the counter keeps on increasing in all the active connections. These are the two basic projects that we will learn using SignalR and with that you will get the basic understanding of what is a hub, what is a client, how to connect and how all the active connection gets the updated data. So with that brief overview, let me get started from the next video. This video, let's take a look at a typical HTTP request and see how that is different or what that cannot accomplish that SignalR can accomplish. Typically, we have a client and a server. Client will be the web browser and server will be where the application is hosted. So when any browser requests a URL or requests something, the request goes to the server, server takes its time and then it gives back a response. If they click something else on the page, then the request might go back to the server, it processes something and gives back a response. It can be either loading of the page or some other details. But client always initiates a request and server responds back with the appropriate data. This is typical scenario with an HTTP request. But when we are working with SignalR, what can happen is client does not need to initiate a request. What will happen is whenever server has new data, it needs to notify client that, hey, this is the new data that is available. If you want, you can use that. If not, you can ignore that. That is the limitation when it comes to an HTTP request. Because in SignalR, the server needs to notify client whenever a new data or something that they want to know is updated. So when we are working with SignalR, it is basically a two-way or an open connection. So the connection does not close. So that means whenever server has to send some data, it can use that existing connection and send some additional data. Now you might be saying that can this be done without SignalR? And of course it can be done. SignalR is just a wrapper that uses the real-time web techniques. So let me give you just the terminology that SignalR can use to communicate real-time data. The first one and default one is WebSockets. WebSockets is the latest technology when it comes to real-time web communication. All the modern browser supports WebSockets. But if your application is supporting some legacy browser, then WebSockets might not be supported. In that case, the fallback will be server sent events. And if that is not available, the last fallback is long polling. Now you might be wondering, what are these terms? Do not worry, we will cover them when the time arrives. But right now you need to remember few things. SignalR is not a magic thing that ASP.NET Core team has discovered. It is just an abstraction on top of these transport types. And using them, we will be establishing a two-way communication between client and server. So with that brief overview of HTTP and transport types in SignalR, let's continue from the next video. We want to start working with SignalR 
to learn what exactly happens when we are using SignalR. The first piece of information that you will understand in SignalR is hubs. Hubs are the critical entry points when we are working with SignalR. In simple terms, Hub is a server-side class that is responsible to send and receive messages from all the connected clients. So it acts as a communication controller when we are working with SignalR. Let me explain this a little more with an example. Let's say you have multiple clients that are connected to an ASP.NET Core MVC application. In MVC, we have models, views, and controller. So our application is open in four browser. Then let's say one of the browser is requesting to go to home controller index action method. So they will initiate a request that I want to open home forward slash index. Then in the middlewares when it goes to routing, it will route that request to the correct controller and index method. That way it is able to return the response back to the client based on whatever view or anything else that is needed. So in this scenario, you can see when you are adding routing to the MVC application, that's how it knows that where the request should be navigated to. When you are adding a signal or hub, you will be adding that and you will be registering what is the route to that particular hub. So we will add a hub in our application and we can give that any route that we want. In this example, we are giving a route of hubs forward slash user count. So that hub is created on the server inside the .NET Core application. Then any browser that opens our application will have an active connection to that particular hub as long as they are on the same page. So this time, if you notice the arrow here, it is a two-way communication and not the one-way communication like we had before. This connection will remain active as long as the page is kept open. And then from client, if they request anything, or even if server wants to send some data, they can send that to the client. They do not have to open a new connection because connection always stays open. So any request from client to the server or server to the client will go through the hub that we have created in SignalR. Now you might be wondering how can we add hub in our application. It is pretty simple. Hub is just a class that is derived from the hub base class in the SignalR library. And we will see that in the next video as well. That being said, there can be multiple hubs in an application. And all of the clients, if they are on the page that is using SignalR, they will have an active connection to the particular hub. We will see all of this in much more details, but I hope you are getting a rough idea of what SignalR will do. If not, do not worry. As we proceed with the first example, everything will make much more sense. So let's continue and create our hub in the next video. Now before we create hub in our application, let me walk you through a 10,000 feet overview of the SignalR flow. Now this flow might change a little bit based on how you are using SignalR, but I just want you guys to have something, that way you can have some checkpoints when you are adding SignalR. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to create the SignalR hub that we will do in the next video. Once the SignalR hub is created, you have to add methods to that hub. After you add methods on hub, then you have to add client side for SignalR. Once the client side is added, then you will have to connect to the SignalR hub from your client side, which can be JavaScript. Once you connect to the SignalR hub, then from the client side JavaScript, you can invoke SignalR hub methods and vice versa. So SignalR hub can also invoke methods in your client side JavaScript to notify clients. And once your client site receives update from the server, you can render some changes in DOM to display the real-time web that we were talking about. So typically these are just checkpoints right now. But once we add SignalR in our project, you will see each and every step in action and then this will make much more sense. 
but typically we are creating a hub on the server side then we will be adding the client side for signal r we will establish a connection between client side and server side and then client can invoke methods on hub and hub can invoke methods on client that is the basic flow when it comes to signal r but do not scratch your head thinking about what are this new terminology all of these seven steps will be done from the next video we will first start by creating our project so i have opened visual studio 2022 let's hit create a new project here i will be creating an mvc project but if you use razor pages or other project type signalr should work the same way we will work with a basic mvc project here and let me call this as signal r sample we will select next here and the dotnet framework will be dotnet 7. now right now dotnet 7 is in preview version so i'm using visual studio 2022 preview but you can use dotnet 6 or any older version signal our logic should be consistent with the older version authentication type i will select individual accounts because i want to show you the integration with application db context or entity framework core with the user identity that it provides so that way we will have all the identity tables configured for us with that change let's hit the create button and perfect project has been created here now the first thing that i would like to do here is add the project to source control so let's add that to a git repository and the repository name looks good which is signal r sample right now i will select the private repository but later on i will make this public once the course is launched so we will hit create and push here and perfect it has been added to source control so now that our project has been created let's continue from the next video now that the project is created we will first work on creating a hub a hub is a server side class that is responsible to send messages to the client and also receive messages from clients so it acts as a communicator so first question how do we add a hub for our signal r application well adding that is pretty simple you can add it anywhere in the code so within our project we will add a new folder and we'll call that as hubs now the reason i'm using plural here is because hub will be a reserved keyword so rather than getting conflicted with the namespace it is best if we call it as hubs here so inside the folder let's add a new class file the first hub that we will create in our project i will call that class name as user hub now this is just a simple class nothing fancy right now but what makes this class a hub is we can implement that and here we will write hub and we will press control dot you can see intellisense is displaying that we can add a using statement for microsoft.aspnet core.signalr let's add that with that piece of code we have created a signal r hub but right now it does not make sense on what this hub is responsible for or what exactly is it doing actually we have not even added signal r in our topnet core project right now in order to add signal r to our project we have to do that in program.cs class file the class file here already has a db context because we added individual user account everything with that looks good but when we are adding services to our container we have to add signal r as well so we will say builder.services.add signal r simple as that that will add signal r service inside our container then if we scroll down where we have the map controller route you can see in mvc we have routes that are provided 
Similarly, when we are working with SignalR and hubs, we have to give our hub a route. That way, the application will know if a request comes in for one of the SignalR hub, how to route it to this user hub class file. So for that, on the app object, we will have a method which is map hub, and that is inside Microsoft.ASP.NetCore.SignalR.Hub. So inside map hub we have to tell which is the hub class. So the class that we want to configure right now is user hub. We will press control dot, add the using statement. And then within the parameters here, we have to give pattern, which is nothing but the route itself. So we can call that as hubs forward slash. This is the user hub. So let's call that as user, or you can be explicit like user count. So just to recap what we have done in this video, we first added a class user hub, and that is just implementing the hub from ASP.NET Core.SignalR.Hub. And then in program.cs, we added SignalR to our services, and we added a route to the SignalR hub that we created. Now, if things are not making sense right now on what are we doing, just stick with me for a couple of videos, and when we see SignalR in action, everything will make more sense. But right now, we have just created a hub, and we have given that a route, so that any methods in that hub can be accessed using this route. So with that, we have accomplished the first step, where we create the SignalR hub, and we added the configuration for route in program.cs. With that first step in place, let's continue from the next video. We have added the user hub in our project. The responsibility of this user hub is to count the number of views on a web page. So let's say if we open a page and if we refresh the page, the count should increase. So it will act as the counter on how many times that page has been viewed. And if let's say two users have opened the same page, the count will be two. And if both of them refresh the page, the count will now be four because both of them have refreshed. So they have basically seen the page two times. That is something that we want to track using SignalR while we are still exploring the basics of SignalR. If you want to go fancy, you can always implement and save things in database but for now, we will keep things in memory and super simple. So inside the user hub, we will add a static int with the name of total views that will track the number of views our website gets. Next thing that we have to do is in our hub, we need to create a method that will be called to increment our total views. So basically, we are creating a method here that will be invoked every time that page loads or reloads. So we will create public async task and I will call this new window loaded. We can call this whatever we want. We are just calling new window loaded that will be called whenever the page is loaded or it is refreshed. Now right now do not worry on how we will call this method. The only thing that we should worry about is when a method is called in this hub what it is responsible for? Well, this is pretty simple. It should just increment the total views. That way we'll be able to track what is the current view or how many users have currently viewed the website. Now, once we increment the total views, remember that right now we are in the hub. We are not on the client side application. So whenever we implement something in the hub, we have to tell all the clients that, hey, the total views have been updated. This is the new count and I want you guys to use this however you want. That is the responsibility of a hub. It will do some processing and then it will tell all the clients that, hey, this value has been updated so you can use them or display that in your website. So here we need to add some piece of logic that will send update to all the connected clients that total views have been updated and doing that is super simple. We will have to await that and we have something called as clients. 
these clients is inside the hub implementation that we have. So hub will have a list of all the clients that are connected. And right now we want to send an update to all the clients that are connected. So we will say clients.all and there is a method send async. Inside here, we first need a method name. So let me call this update total views. Now you might be wondering that where is this method? Well, we do not have that method right now, but we will be creating that in the upcoming videos. This method will be located inside the client side of the application. Hub is running on the server side. So server is telling that, hey, when the new window loaded is invoked on the hub, I want to update the total views here. And then I want to call this method update total views, which will be located on the client side. Now, when we call the update total views, it makes sense that we have to pass the total views. Only then they will know that, hey, this is the current view count of the website. So in order to pass parameter, it is pretty simple. You can add a comma and you can pass as many parameters as you want. So if there are more than one parameters, you can add one more comma and you can continue like that. We just have one parameter right now. When the new window loaded on the hub is invoked, we want to increment the total views and we want to implement a method update total views on all the clients and we will also pass the total view count. So if we switch back to our presentation, in this video, we added methods to our hub. But on top of that, we also did one more thing and that's not in the order like I said before. So along with point two, we also covered point six, where in SignalR hub, we have added a method that will invoke the client side method to notify clients. But that method we have not created yet. We will do that in the upcoming videos, but our hub now also invokes some method in the client side. So basically we have covered points one, two, and six. With that in place, let's continue from the next video. Now, so far we have implemented hub and we have also added our first method which is new window loaded that is responsible to invoke a method on the client side which will be update total views now before we start adding this method inside javascript of our project as the client side of the application we still do not have the client side of signal r we have added signal r on the server side where we have added that to our services and we also added the hub route inside program.cs. So now you might be wondering, how do I add the client side library for SignalR? That is pretty simple. We will right click on SignalR sample, which is our project name, add, and here we have to add a client side library. We will use the unpkg and then we have to type the library name. That library name is Microsoft forward slash signal R and we want the latest one. So let's add that. You can see it is adding many files to our project, but honestly, we only need the signal R.js file. Let me install the complete library and then we have to add a link to signal R.js. The library that we added is installed in www root. We have lib. Inside there, we have Microsoft, SignalR, DIST, browser, and inside there, we have SignalR.js. You can leave it right here, but I'm just gonna move this inside the JS folder. That way, I can easily reference that rather than navigating through the lib folder. So perfect, we have added the client side signal R to our project. Now in the next video, we still need to create the update total views in the client side of the project. Let's switch back to the presentation real quick. And in this video, we completed adding the client side signal R. Now before we work with anything else, let's run our project 
and take a look at the output. So perfect. Right here we have the basic template of home page, privacy page. We have login and registration that comes with the .NET identity. So this is the basic template that gets loaded with .NET Core identity. Now we will be working on the home page. So let me stop the application. We will go to our views here, home, index. Let me remove everything, add a div here, give it a class of container. And inside there, we will add a div, give that a class of row. Inside there, we will add another div, give it a class of column three, and we want to display total views. To display the total views, let me add another div, give it a class of column four. And inside there, I will add a span with the ID of total views counter. This is just an ID that we have given to our span. Right now, there is no value in the span, but we will be loading that pretty soon. If we run the application now, we will just see the total views and that looks good. If we run the application, we will see the default home page, but we just have total views there and it's empty right now. Now we will be using SignalR in the index page, so let me add that. Right here, we can add a script tag, give it an src of js. We have signalr.js. That will add the client side library of SignalR inside our index view. So there is one thing that you should be clear right now. Even though we are working on the same application, when it comes to SignalR, there are two different pieces. One is SignalR client and the other one is SignalR server or hub. So inside program.cs or the hub that we added, that is the server side of SignalR. And then we will be having a client side inside our views that will be communicating with our user hub and it will be invoking the methods that we see there. So on the client side, we need to set up a connection to our hub. And the route for that connection is if we scroll down, hubs forward slash user count. So from the client, which will be our JavaScript that we will be adding, we need to establish a connection to our user hub. Let's establish that connection in the next video. Now that we have added signalr.js inside our index.cshtml, we need to actually connect to the signalr hub from our client side of the application. So in order to do that, let's add a JavaScript file in our project. So new item here, let me search for Java. There it is. I will call this file as users count dot js let's add that this will be the client side of our signal r and here we have to do four things first we need to establish a connection to the signal r hub so for that we will say variable connection let's call this user count is equal to new we will be using signal r on there we have method which is hub connection builder you can add some configuration within the parameters here, but we will go with the simple one for now. On that, we have the with URL, and here we have to give the URL of our SignalR hub. So we have that in program.cs. Let's go there and copy the route that we are using for our user hub. Paste it right here. That will establish the new SignalR connection with the hub at this location. On this with URL, we will finally invoke build and that will create our connection. Now this is basically a connection string where we are creating a connection, but we are not establishing that connection yet. We have to start that connection at the very end so right now we are just creating that connection here with the SignalR hub. Once the connection is established, there are two things if we take a look at our user hub. We have a method here, so we need something to invoke this method 
and then our hub also invokes some method in our client so we need the two-way connection so if we take a look at comments here first thing that we have is connect to methods that hub invokes aka receive notifications from the hub so from hub what are the notification that it is sending right now it is sending something to all the client with the name of update total views and it has a parameter so if we want to receive this notification we have to implement this update total views inside the client side so let me copy this name here go back to our js and for that we have connection that is connection user count so on this connection we have an on method and there we have to write the method name on which we want to register a handler so that is update total views and when this method is invoked we are actually receiving a value that value is the total views so we can retrieve that as a value here and we'll have an error function and we can do whatever we want right here so when we receive the total views from the user hub inside our index.cshtml we have a span of total views counter we have to update that with the value that hub provides us for the total views so we can go to our js here and we can say variable new count span is equal to document.get element by id let's get the span with the id of total views counter and then on the new count span dot inner text we want to set that text to be value dot to string so that will append the value that we receive as the inner text of the total views counter so this will happen when the hub will send notification to all the clients but in order for hub to send the notification something has to invoke this new window loaded that comes next year we have invoke hub methods so when something happens we need to trigger a method that is located on hub so here we will create a function and i will call this new window loaded on client when this function will be invoked at that time on our signal or connection that we have which is connection user count we want to invoke a method so here you might be tempted to use invoke but if you scroll down you will see there is something called as send as well let me use that for now and later on i will tell you the difference so on the connection we are sending something that will be the method name that we want to invoke so on hub the method is new window loaded let's paste that right here so perfect when the function of new window loaded on client will be invoked it will actually invoke the hub method which is new window loaded we have connected to the method that hub invokes and we have also added method to invoke methods that are inside the hub last thing that we have to do here is start the connection so for that on our connection we have start and then we have promise so we will use start then in there we can have two methods one is unfulfilled and one is rejected so what should happen if the connection is established successfully and what should happen if it fails so for that let me also create two more methods here one will be function fulfilled and one will be function rejected so if everything is successful we might want to do something when it starts and if it is rejected or it fails then we might want to lock something or do something else so inside then here we can call fulfilled if everything is successful and we can call rejected if there are any errors right now if you want you can just do console.log here and i will lock connection to user hub successful so we have added quite a few code inside our js file to connect to our signal or hub if we switch back to our powerpoint we have successfully connected to signal or hub from the client javascript and restarted the connection then from the client side we called the signal or hub methods 
And finally, we also use the dot on to receive update from the SignalR hub. So all the bits and pieces of typical SignalR flow is covered. So let's see everything in action in the next video. So we have added quite a few code in the client side for our SignalR. In this video, let me walk you through on what we did so far. That way you have a complete overview of what we are doing. So first we are establishing a connection here to our SignalR hub where we are using the route that we provided inside program.cs. That will create the connection. Once the connection is made, then we are registering to methods that the hub invokes. So if we go to user hub, our hub is invoking this method, which is update total views. So we are telling SignalR that, hey, I want to connect to that method. So I want to receive notifications when server or hub calls this update total views. And when this method is called, we receive some value in the parameters, which is the total views. So we will retrieve that and we are just appending that to a span and changing its inner text. Pretty straightforward. So here we are hooking to a method that hub invokes. Then in our hub, we have this method new window loaded. In order to invoke that method, we have added a function here, which is new window loaded on client. When this function will be invoked on connection, it is using send to invoke the hub method. So here we are calling a method on the hub. Here we are connecting to a method that is there on the hub. Here we are connecting to a method that hub invokes. Next, we have added two basic JavaScript function, fulfilled and rejected, and we are using them when we start the connection. Fulfilled will be called first, and that will be responsible when everything is successful. So let's say once everything is successful, we want some notification. We can do that right here. And if it fails, then rejected will be called. So with that, the client side of SignalR is configured. The last thing that we have to do here is if we go to our index, we added the SignalR.js. We also have to register all the code that we added in user's count. So we will be adding JS for user's count. With that in place, let's run the application. Even though we have user's count here, you can see total views is not getting affected. But if you press F12 here, you will see we have logged that connection to user hub was successful. And if you notice information here, we are using WebSocket to connect. So basically we have connected to the SignalR hub and that connection was successful. Now next what you need to notice here is we actually need to invoke this function new window loaded on client that will actually invoke the hub method here and it will increment the total views and call the update total views on all the clients that have registered. This client has already registered right here. So let's copy this method name and let's invoke when the connection is successful. So after we log, let's invoke the new window loaded on client here. This time when we run the application, we will see the total views in action and perfect. You can see total view count is one. If you refresh the page, that is incrementing. But if we copy this local host, and open new incognito window, paste it here, great. You can see the view count automatically updates on both the windows. If I refresh one window, the other one also gets the change. That is the beauty and power of SignalR. So congratulations, with that we have implemented the very first project using SignalR and we have seen that in action. With this accomplishment, let's continue from the next video. In the current application, we are displaying total views. If we refresh that, or if we open up a new incognito window, that is automatically getting updated in both the windows. That functionality looks good.
right now what I want to implement is I want the total number of connected session. What that basically means is that if there is a new window, that is a new connection. But if we refresh that window, then that does not count towards a new connection. So we basically want to track whenever a new connection is made and when that connection is closed, we want to decrement that count. So for that inside our project, let's open up the user hub where we are maintaining the total views. We will have to add one more integer here, which will be total users. Initially, the total users will be zero, but when a connection is made to our hub, then we will be incrementing total user. If a connection is disconnected, then we will be decrementing this total users. So basically, we want to tap into the connection and disconnection method of the user hub. These are built-in methods that are available and we can overwrite them. So we will say public override task and the method name is on connected async and on disconnected async. So when the connection is made, we will increment total users by one. And then let me implement the disconnected. So task on disconnected async. Right here, we will decrement the total users by one. Now, whenever the total users are incremented or decremented, we have to send this total users to all of the connected clients. That way they can use that and display that on the page. So just like we had a method here, update total views, we will create one more method, which will be update total users. So let me paste the same line here, but we will change the method name to be update total users. Let's paste that. Now for the send async, it needs an await. So we can remove that and we can call get awaiter dot get result. That will basically wait for this execution before it proceeds on the next line. So we can do the same thing here. Let me hide this. Get awaiter dot get result. Now we need to implement the update total users. That will be inside the JS file users count. We have the connection here on update total views. We need another connection on when the hub method of update total users is invoked. We want to capture that right here. We will receive a value here and that value will be total users. So let me pass that instead of total views. Perfect, that looks good. Now previously, we were modifying the total views counter inside the index view. Let's go there and let me create one more property. We will copy this row, paste it here, and I will call this total connection or user, and this will be total users counter. Let's copy that ID. We will get that document by ID. And the inner text here, we will pass the value that we will receive for the total user. This time we do not have to invoke method inside the fulfilled or any other place because it is automatically invoked on connection and disconnection. So with that in place, let's run our project. And perfect, you can see the total connection and users is also one. Now, if for some reason this is not being loaded, make sure to press Ctrl F5 to hard refresh. That way the JavaScript gets loaded if it is cached in the browser. But if we refresh here, you can see the total views is getting updated, but the total connection stays the same. Let's establish a new connection here in incognito window. Let me copy the URL, paste it here, and perfect. As soon as we make a new connection, you can see the total connection is updated. Let's copy this and open that in a new tab here. And great, now the connections are three. If we close them, you will notice that it decrements in all the browser. So with that, we have seen the connected and disconnected method inside our SignalR hub. With that, let's continue from the next video. We have completed the first simple project with SignalR.
and inside project resources, documents, I have a PDF for SignalR basic flow. Here I'm just going through what we covered so far in this section. So in order to get SignalR, first thing we have to do is we have to create a SignalR hub. We are adding that class here and we are adding builder.services.addSignalR and we add the route for that hub. That is the first step. Next step is to add methods to our hub. So inside our hub, we created a variable total views and we added a method new window loaded. That increments the total views. Then we have to add client side signal R. So we added the client side library and we configured signal R there. We added that signal RJS inside our view. Then we have to connect to signal R hub from the client JavaScript. So we create a connection using new signalr.hub connection builder dot with URL and we will write the same path that we wrote in program.cs. We will start that connection and we'll have fulfilled and rejected right there. After that from client, we will invoke the signalr hub method using connection.send and then the method name. This new window loaded is the method name of our signalr hub that we created. So that's how we will be invoking the methods inside our signalr hub. The next thing that we have to do is when the hub method is invoked, it need to invoke some method in the client JavaScript. So that we want to invoke on all of the connected clients. So we'll say await clients.all.sendAsync, the method name and the parameters. This method we will have to create in the client side JavaScript. So we scroll down, we create that using our connection dot on, and then we write the method name, the parameters, and what we want to update. So here we are basically hooking on to the notification that SignalR Hub sends to the client. And after we receive that notification, we can toggle the DOM. So that is the basic flow that we have covered when it comes to SignalR and that is what we covered in the SignalR typical flow. Now, as I've said before, it does not always have to follow this order, but you need to make sure that you are configuring all of these points so this can act as a cheat sheet when you are working with SignalR. So with that in place, let's continue from the next video. Now that we have seen one example with SignalR, I want to dive a little bit more into the different transport protocols that we have. As I've said before, SignalR acts as a wrapper on top of these protocols. The default one is WebSockets, then we have servers and events, and then long polling. It is critical to know some of the differences on how each of this work, that way you can architect the application in an efficient way if you have to. But before all of that, we saw how HTTP requests work. Client is the only one that can initiate a request and server only gives back a response. In a traditional HTTP, server cannot initiate a request or server directly cannot send some response without a request. And that is where real-time communication comes into picture. But one thing that you have to remember here is when a request is received to the server, it will take some time to process that request and then it sends a response. After the response is sent from the server, that connection is dropped. It is no longer active. So that connection cannot be used again to send any more data. That is the critical piece when it comes to HTTP. If client has one more request, it will initiate a new connection. And of course, I've said before, only client can initiate a request. Server cannot initiate a response or a request. It will just have a response when client sends a request. So that is the traditional HTTP. So to solve the issue when server wants to send a response without any existing connection, we have different protocols. The first one is WebSockets. WebSockets is the answer to the problem that we saw in the previous presentation. And good news is that in today's world, all of the modern browsers 
supports WebSockets. Now you might be thinking that how can WebSockets solve our problem? If you can see in the presentation here, the connection is not a one-way connection. It is a two-way connection and it stays open. So whenever a client has something that it wants from the server or it wants to notify, it can use that existing open connection and send that message. And server, if it does not want to respond back, it does not have to. But let's say after an hour or after some time, server has some notification. It does not need to open a new connection. The connection is already there. It will just use that existing connection and send data to the client. So that is the best case scenario that we have. But what if for some reason WebSockets is not supported? In that case, we have something called as server sent events. Let's see how that works. So in case of server sent event, a client will have a request to the server and then server will not give a response back. It will rather create an event pipeline. Using that communication channel that server creates, it will be able to interact with the client. So the server sent events that server is creating, it is only one way. It is not bidirectional like we saw in WebSockets. So whenever a server has to send some message to the client, it can use the event connection that it has. But if client has to send something to the server, it has to use the traditional HTTP request. So client communicates with the server to traditional HTTP request, but server uses the event connection to communicate or pass data down to the clients. So the first fallback to WebSockets is server sent events. And let's say in worst case scenario, there is some situation where server sent event is also not supported. Then you can fall back to long polling. Let me explain how that works. We have a client and a server. In traditional HTTP, client sends a request and server responds back and closes that connection. But when it comes to long polling, the connection does not close. It always waits for a response from the server. And then it waits. So server will not have any response. It will just stay idle until it has something that it has to send back to the client. Now it does not wait for unlimited amount of time. There is a timeout which is about two minutes. So in two minutes, if server does not have any response, that connection will time out. But at the same time, client will initiate a new request and then it starts waiting again. So client will basically have a channel which will always be open. If it times out in two minutes, it starts a new channel. So that way server will always have a connection when it has a message, it will send back. So let's say this time server has a response, it will respond back and client can trigger notification or use that. And after that response, client will again open a new connection and so on. And that is why the name long polling. It just opens a connection and waits until the server responds back. Now long polling has been supported in browsers since a very very long time. So if nothing works then long polling will definitely work in your situation. So with that we have seen WebSockets, server sent events and long polling. WebSockets is the best one available and it is the fastest because the connection is a two-way channel and it is always open. A fallback for WebSockets is server sent events where the client will start a request and server will have an event connection to send the messages. But in server sent events, client cannot use the event channel. It always has to use the traditional HTTP request. And last but not the least is long polling where it initiates a request and keeps on waiting until server has a response. And if it does not, it times out and establishes a new connection right away. And WebSockets is the default route when it comes to SignalR. But you can also change the default transport type in SignalR, which we will see in the upcoming videos. With that brief overview on the transport types supported by SignalR, let's continue from the next video. In order to send a notification to all of the clients, we use something which is await 
clients, which is inside the hub itself, dot all, dot send async. But when it comes to SignalR, we have multiple options with clients, and I want to walk you through all of them. So let me switch back to the presentation here, and you can see we have a SignalR connection. Let's say we have multiple browser open here. So we have ABC and XYZ all connected to our SignalR hub. So all of them will have a bidirectional channel to communicate. Then what we want is let's say the tab A here is sending something to the hub. And in the response here, we want that hub to send notification to all of the connected clients. To do that, we will use the same method that we did before. We will have await clients.all.sendAsync. That will send this particular notification to all of the connected clients. But let's say we have a different situation here. In this example, our tab B has invoked some method on the SignalR hub. Now in the response here, we only want a notification to be sent to the caller. So for that, we have a different method which is await clients.caller.sendAsync. So rather than all, we will be using caller this time. It will only send a notification back to the caller, that is B in our case. Then let's say we have another situation in which A is sending a notification on the server. But in response, we want to send a notification to everyone other than the caller. So for that, we have clients.others.sendAsync. That will send a notification to all the client other than the one that invoked the notification. Next example is let's say tab B is sending something over to the server. Now the response we only want to send to connection A. How can we do that? All of the connections that we have in SignalR are identified using connection ID. Now how will we get this connection ID? Do not worry about that right now. But if you want to send a message notification only to tab A, you can do that using clients.client .client, and then in the parameter, you have to give the connection ID of the A tab. That will send a notification only to that particular tab. Similarly, in another example, let's say B is initiating a request, but it wants the response to be sent to A and C. In that case, we can pass multiple connection ID inside clients.clients .clients, and then we have a comma separated list where we can write all of the connection ID where notification should be sent. So you can see when we have to decide where to send the notification, we have multiple options when it comes to SignalR. But that is not it. Let's say we have B here and then we want to send to all of the users other than A and C. Using connection ID, we have something called as all accept. So it will send notification to all of the clients except the connection ID that we have in parameters. So accept A and C, it will send the notification to everyone else. So that is when we are working with clients and connection ID. But when we work with ASP.NET and we have the identity, we can identify everything based on the user itself. So if a user is logged in, let's say Ben has two connection A and B, Sam has connection C and X, and Jess has connection Y and Z. These are the identity users, so if you are logged in using the identity, you can uniquely identify all the connection based on the user ID. How to do that, we will see in the upcoming videos, but that is something that you can do with SignalR. So in this case, let's say our server has user-specific notification. An example could be someone wants to export an Excel, and the Excel is going to take quite some time. So when they hit the export button, we display them a notification that it is processing, and once processed, you will see a notification. So then user can browse the website, and when the processing is done, the server can send a notification to the client that, hey, the export that you requested is now available, and if that user has two tabs open, we want to send notification to all the tabs. So in that case, we want to send notification to all the tabs of that particular user. 
To do that, we have clients.user and then in the parameters, you have to write the username or the user ID. We will go into more details, but that is how you can send notification to all the tabs of user ben at gmail. Now with users, you can get more fancy. Let's say you want to send notification to Ben as well as Jess. So in that case, you can say clients.user and you can pass a list of all of the user ID or user email. So with that, you can see we have identity that we can build in with SignalR and we can get pretty fancy. But let's say you have many users in your website and based on the roles, you want all the users in that role to be notified. So for that, we have something called as groups. In SignalR, we can group all of the users and then we can send a notification to a particular group. So all of the connection in that group will be notified. Let me walk you through the presentation on groups in the next video. Now that we can see our first hub in action and we have multiple methods on that as well, I want to point out one little detail here. When we are invoking any of the hub methods, you can see we are using send on the connection. But as I was talking before, there is also something called as invoke. So what is the difference between send and invoke when you are calling the hub methods from the connected client in JavaScript that we are using right now? To give you a straightforward answer, when you use send, you do not get any response back from the server. But when you use invoke, it expects a value or rather it waits for a value to be returned when the request is successful. So let's take a look at that with an example. We are calling the new window loaded in our user hub here. Right now it is not returning anything, but rather let's return a string. So right here we are returning back total views and we are passing the value as well. Perfect. So let's go back to our JS file and on the method here we can use then that way we are waiting for a promise. So then we will wait for a value. Let's call that value. When we receive that, we just want to log that. So let's do console.log and let's log the value here. Rather than send here, first let's try invoke. So with that, let's run the application. And let me press F12 for the console window here. Perfect. It displays the total views is 1. If we refresh here, you can see it is getting updated. So perfect, it is logging everything. That basically means that whatever is being returned from the hub here, it is able to capture that and we are able to use that right here. But if we use send here, then it does not get value back from the hub. So value will be undefined. Let's run this and check that out. Let's press F12 here and great. You can see the value is undefined here. So that is the main difference that we have right here. Now for some reason on this function, if you had to pass parameters, you can always pass them right here. We do not need that, but let's say for some reason we wanted to pass some string parameter here. I'll just pass my name right now. Then from the hub, when we are returning back the value here, I'll just say from and I'll have interpolation. Let's add the parameter here, string name, and let's pass name as well. So that way we are able to pass parameters to hub from our client code. If you want more parameters, you can just add more commas and add all the parameters. Let's run the application and whoops, we have to change this from send to invoke. Let's do that. And let's run the application. This time in the logs, you will see the name that we passed in the parameter. And perfect, you can see it is working as expected. So with that, we have seen the difference between send and invoke and how you can pass parameters to your hub methods. With that in place, let's continue from the next video.
let me show you how you can change or select the default transport type for your SignalR hub. So that would be done when you are creating a connection inside the JS right here. When you have the with URL, you can pass more parameters here. So let's add a comma here. And right here you can see we have the transport type. So if we go to SignalR dot, we have the HTTP transport type dot, and there we have all the transport types that are available. We have long polling, we have server sent events and web sockets. Web sockets are used by default in the modern browser. But let's say for some reason, if you want to use the server sent events, you can pass that right here. With that change, let's run the application. In order to see the change here, if we press F12, you can see in the logging here, it displays SSE connected, which is the server sent event. If we close that, we can change that to long polling. If for some reason you want to do that, that could also be done. So now if we press F12 here, and if we see logs here, it does not display that we are using SSE or WebSocket. It just says connected. It does not display if we are using SSE or WebSockets or long polling. One way to find out is if we go to our network tab and let me refresh here. You can see the status of all the call and one call stays pending. That is long polling. It will basically wait for about 2 minutes or 1.5 minutes and then it will close this connection and it will open a new long polling connection. So let's wait for that. And perfect, you can see that this connection has closed with a 200 and it opened up a new connection which is pending. You can see the time here as well and if you keep on waiting, it will keep on closing connection and open new connection once the time passes. So that's long polling in action. Now let me close this and switch this back to WebSockets and let's run the project. This time if you examine the logs here, you will see that it has been connected using WebSocket. And perfect, that looks good. If you go to the network tab and if you refresh here, you will not see long polling. You can see the user count is connected with WebSockets now. So that is a brief overview on how you can change the transport type using SignalR. Now there is also something called as none, but it does not make sense to use that because then you will not be using SignalR. I will leave this as WebSockets and that looks good. One more thing that I want to point out is when we are using SignalR, you can see there are logs that are being displayed in the console window. Now you can change what is the level of logging that you want for your SignalR application. Let me show that quickly on how that could be done when we are establishing the connection. For that we have something called as configure logging and inside there we have signalr.log level and we have the multiple logs level right here. We have critical, debug, error, information, none which will be useful in production and we have something called as trace. Trace is the most detailed logging that you will get with SignalR. So if something is not working and you cannot figure out, you can switch that to Trace to see what's going on. We can keep that as information for now. Now we will not be diving into logs right now, but down the road if something does not work with the course, we will definitely take a look at that. So that being said, I can comment out the logging. I just wanted to quickly show you that that feature is available if you have to use that. With that in place, let's continue from the next video. Now that we have seen basic with SignalR, it's time to take one level up and learn something different with SignalR. For that, let me first close all the tabs that we have open here and let me pin the Solution Explorer. I like to create a static detail to store all the constants in my application. So let's add a new item here that will be a class file. I will name that SD for static details. 
and I'll make this a static class here. Inside there, I want few properties. The next functionality that we want to implement is we want to implement an online voting system, but we will be using API calls for that. So anyone who has access to that API, if they enter that, that will automatically count as a vote. So basically we want to build a race system to see which is the favorite Deathly Hollows in Harry Potter. So first thing first, we will create constant for wand, stone, and cloak. Next inside the static detail, let's create a dictionary. String will be type of Deathly Hollow, which can be wand, stone, or cloak. And the integer value here will be the number of votes that they have received. Inside the constructor here, we can initialize everything to be zero. So we are adding the dictionary of Deathly Hollow Rays. In there, we are adding cloak with a count of zero. We are adding stone with a count of zero. And we are adding wand with a count of zero. So initially, everything will be zero. This is just the basic setup. Next thing, let's go and work on the same index view. Now, rather than typing all the HTML and CSS, I have provided that in the snippets folder. So if you go to the course detail, you can download all of the project resources. Inside there, there is snippet. Section three, we have race. Let's copy this div here and make sure to paste that inside the container. Let's just paste that. Let's run the application and see what we have here. Perfect. So right here we have the Deathly Hollow Race and we have Invisibility Cloak, Resurrection Stone and Elder Wand. In order to vote, you have to go to this particular URL. You can see the port number that I have is 7001, but what I have is 7170. I like to change that to 7001, that way it's easier to remember. In order to edit that, we have to go to properties and launch settings.json. We have the 7170 for HTTPS. Let's change that to 7001 and save it. Let's run the application to make sure that works. And perfect. Now we are running on port 7001. And inside there, we have a home controller, but we need to add an action method of Deathly Hollows. And we need type, which will be a string parameter. So let's close this. Let's go to our home controller. And after index here, let me add a new action method. I will call that as Deathly Hollows. The return type here, let me just do accepted and that's okay. So what will happen is in the type we will receive what is the type user is voting for. If that falls within the key that we have, if that is a valid key inside our static details, then we will increment the counter right here. So to do that, we will go to our home controller and we will check if st dot, we have the deathly hollow race. It contains the key of type here. If it does, then we want to increment the value. So st dot deathly hollow race of type and let's increment that by one. So that way we are incrementing the counter of our deathly hollow race. Let me just add a debugger on the accepted here and run the application. Now, in order to test if this is working or not, we will require Postman. If you do not have Postman, you can just copy this URL, go to a tab and paste it. That will bring you to our breakpoint. And if you examine the Deathly Hollow Rays, you can see Cloak has one vote now. Let's hit continue here. Let's copy the URL for Resurrection Stone and we'll paste that here. Let's hit enter. This time the stone will have one count as well. That's perfect. So if we hit this again, this time stone should have a count of two. So great. Now our logic is working as expected when we call the API, our static detail, which has the Deathly Hollow race count is getting updated. But our task is to display that race count 
and the values right here. If we go back and if we take a look at the index.html, you can see I have added span for cloak counter, stone counter, and wand counter. So whatever value we have in dictionary for each one of this, we want to display them just like we did in the user counter we retrieved document.getElementById, we modified the text right there. So let's work on that from the next video. Now we need to implement race for our deathly hollows. For that you can use the same hub that we have and add more methods if you want, but I will be creating a separate hub for our deathly hollows. So inside the hubs here, let's add a new class and I'll name it Deathly Hollows Hub. Let's add that. This will have to implement the hub. We will add control dot for ASP.NET Core dot signal R. There will be only one method inside this hub where we just want to get what is the current count of the Deathly Hollow race. So that will return the dictionary that we have where we are storing the race count for the Deathly Hollow race. So let's add a public method. The return type here will be dictionary of string comma int and we'll call this get race status. Here we just have to return sd dot deathly hollow race. This is the method that needs to be invoked from the client. So we will have to add the JS file as well from where we will be invoking the get race status to get what is the current status of the race. But before we work on the client side, our hub setup is not yet complete. We need to add that inside the program.cs and we need to register a route for that as well. So we'll say app.maphub, we need the class name here and inside there we need to pass the route. Route will be hubs forward slash deathly hollows. With that, our hub configuration looks good for the deathly hollows. Next thing that we have to do is inside home controller, where we are modifying the deathly hollows right here, we need to invoke some method to notify all the clients that are connected to the deathly hollows hub that, hey, the race count has been updated, you need to get the new data. Let's do that in the next video. Now first we need to create a JS for the new hub that we created. So let me copy the user account that we have, paste it one more time and I will rename this to Deathly Hollows. We will change the connection name here to connection Deathly Hollows and then we need to make sure the URL is correct. If we go to program.cs, let me copy this, go back and we'll paste it right here. Let me add a forward slash there and that looks good. We do not need web sockets here, that is explicit. So let's go with the basic with URL. After that, let me copy the connection name and we want to invoke some methods. Now for this particular race, we only want one method that is responsible to update the UI in index.cshtml. We have all these spans here. So basically we want to be notified when a method is called, that way we can update the UI. We will call that method as update deathly hollows count and that time we want to receive three parameters. We want to receive the cloak count, we want to receive the stone count and we want to receive the wand count. When we receive these three, we can get all of them by document by ID. So let's do that index.cshtml we have the cloak counter let's get that it will be cloak span we paste that two more times here next one is stone counter and we have the wand counter we will rename the variables here that looks good now if you want, you can cut three of these and just paste it at the global level right here so we can use them. We will modify the cloak span dot inner text is equal to cloak dot to string. 
Same thing we will do with stone and wand. So let me do that real quick here. And perfect. So here we are just updating the inner text of span based on the count that we receive on the call of this update deathly hollow count. Now so far what we have seen the on methods that we have we typically invoke them from fulfilled or maybe the hub method. But this time the method that we have here will not be invoked from the JS directly. It would rather be invoked from the controller when we invoke the deathly hollows action method. So how can we invoke that from controller? Let me remove everything else here in the meanwhile. We don't need this. Let's keep fulfilled but we don't have any method and the connection name will be connection deathly hollows. So now we just have one method in our JS file and this is the method to receive notification from hub. Now the next thing we need to work on is how to invoke this method on hub inside our home controller. Let's take a look at that in the next video. Now if we take a look at the previous hub that we created, user hub, you can see we were invoking methods to all of the clients from the hub itself. But this time we want to invoke that from the home controller. Doing that is super simple thanks to dependency injection. We will just be injecting the iHub context on the deathly hollow hub that we created. Let's press control dot and add the using statements. We will be adding that in dependency injection. So let me do that. Perfect. Let's go back to our action method right here. So once we update the deathly hollow race count based on the type, we want to send a notification to all of the clients that, hey, something has been updated with the deathly hollows. And if we take a look at where we are consuming, we need the cloak, stone and wand as parameter. So let me copy this method name here and we will say await underscore deathly hub dot clients dot all. Now you might be wondering why are we using dot all or what is exactly client? Do not worry, we will get to all of that. All basically means that we want to notify all the clients that are connected that hey, this method has been invoked and these are the parameters. So on this, we will be using send async and we need the method name followed by the parameters. Three parameters that we want is cloak, stone, and want count. That count is inside static detail dot deathly hollow race. And the key here will be sd dot cloak, comma, next will be stone followed by wand. And perfect, it's easy as that. With that in place, let me remove the debugging point and run the project. Right now, right now we don't have any values here. Let me copy this. Open a new incognito window and let's paste that. We pasted cloak here, but you can see nothing's happening. Let's debug this and see what's going on. Let me add a debugging point here just to make sure we are hitting that. Press enter here. Yes, we are. And the cloak counter is four. So that is actually working. But I think I know what's going on. I don't think we have added the JS for Deathly Hollows. And of course that won't work. So we will be adding Deathly Hollows.js and let's run the project one more time. Now when you are testing the SignalR application in the debug mode and if you have the previous tab open, let me show that. Like this one, I didn't close it and I just rebuilt the solution. It is common to see this error message. So if you see this, don't worry, just close all the tabs here, press OK and run the project one more time. Perfect, you can see the error goes away. Now let's open the incognito window here. Let's copy the URL for stone and let's paste that. Hits our breakpoint, let's continue. And great, now you can see the counter is getting updated. Let me remove the debugging point. 
So you can see if I press two, it updates. I press that one more time. Let's copy the URL for cloak here. And that's working. But right now there is one issue. Let's open a new tab here and let me copy the URL localhost and let me open the same URL. You can see even though there are values here, they are not being reflected here. If we go back to the URL and run this one more time, then the values are coming along. But the first time the page is loaded in a new tab, it doesn't work. I want you guys to fix this. We have used the method to make sure that when this is loaded, it gets the correct value. I want you guys to pause the video and think about how we can do that. I will show you the solution in the next video. I hope you were able to figure out the solution on what needs to be updated so that when a new connection is made, it automatically loads the current race count for the Deathly Hollow race. That is pretty simple and we have already done that in other pieces of our hub. We basically need to take advantage of the fulfilled method. So when the connection is established, we want to load all of this div with the current value of cloak, stone and wand. How can we get the current value? That is simple as well. If you see inside our hub, we implemented one method, get race status and that returns back the Deathly Hollow Race Dictionary. So let's go back here inside Fulfilled. We will use our connection Deathly Hollows. On there, we cannot use Send because we are waiting for a response and from that response, we will be fetching values. So we have to use Invoke here and we need the method name. If we go to our hub, the method name is get race status. Let me paste that. We have a promise, so we'll use then here. Variable, let me call that as race counter goes to. And we just need to assign values. So let me copy this, paste it one more time here. This will be inside the race counter. In there, there will be cloak, stone, and bond. Let's paste that here. And that's all that we had to do. Let's run the project and see this in action. Everything is zero here. Let's copy the URL, paste it, and refresh the page a few times. The cloak is four now. Let's copy this and open a new window. Paste it here. Perfect. You can see now it is loaded already. And if we go back, or if we copy some other URL here, let's paste it here. And great, you can see everything is working as expected. So with that, our Deathly Hollow race is functional and working as expected. Hope that gave you a good foundation with SignalR. If you are interested in more advanced topics and more projects with SignalR, I have a complete course on SignalR on .NET Mastery.com. In that full course, I will be building 8 projects and all of them will implement different use case of SignalR. I have a video of demo in which I will display what will be the 8 applications that we will be building. So take a look at that and if you want to advance your journey with SignalR, I will see you later in the course SignalR the Complete Guide. But I hope you have enjoyed the free video and do not forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel. Good luck and happy coding!